think we'll start now almost everybody articulated it's wonderful to see a group of people in the room and also participate over zoom um with our nice group of people and i hope you enjoy our presentations my name is Ina Dukunova. i am citizen trail application specialist at Carbi. and today i would like to highlight opportunities in cancer research enabled by card buyer signature. So most of you probably are familiar with the company card buyer is new to the business and has been on the market for a while uh, trying to provide solutions for next next generation systems in research. But over the last two years company went through a huge transformation. We developed new technologies, we developed new approaches uh, company invests a lot of money in research and development, moving very fast, and now we can say proudly that we are a global company with 700 plus employees, uh, constantly working on improving tools for the research. So, what is high firing? What actually a company does? Uh, today, we primarily will focus on that despite the fact that uh, PagBio has some different technologies as well as short sequencing, which is coming next year, and um, DNA extraction products. But today, we will be talking exclusively about high five sequencing. So, what does that mean? High five reading. First of all, it reads our both room 50 to 20 k uh, kilobase currently and highly accurate, at least 99.9% accuracy. And it's been shown that it's a, um, incredibly important for very many applications that it enables very many different uh, applications, such as genome assembly, when very often we don't even need to have a reference genome, complex populations, when you have separate different um, components of the population and accurately sequences of uh, next generation of RNA sequencing, targeted sequencing, variant detection, and epigenetics. So how it all works is actually incredibly simple. You start with high quality double stranded DNA. You like gate smart bell adapters to the uh, end of it. And then when you open it, it creates a circle. You attach polymerase and primers to it, and it's just like a plasmid in the bacteria. It keeps rolling and rolling and rolling and reading the same target over and over and over again. And when you do the analysis, you just remove the adapters and you have those sequences. And when you look at them when you compile them together consensus is incredibly accurate because it's been read so many times any error is eliminated and we can achieve accuracy of 99.999 percent another as aspect uh, incredibly important for our sequencing as you see we yes is how it so instead of creating all kinds of complicated nanopores, we just use tiny routes, which are called ZMWs, uh, zero mode waveline. And one molecule of DNA is placed in one well. And on the smart cell, we have 8 million wells. Can you imagine that every well, or even half of the wells, have one molecule of DNA? With four million reads in one smart cell. And uh, because uh, it's distributed that way, you can be sure that you have one molecule read, single molecule read, very long read, very accurate. And the signal is detected by specific fluorophore attached to specific nucleotide. And this is again how it works. I really like this video, but uh, I don't think we need to dwell more about that. You can see that uh, this is very elegant and very simple solution for what we call third generation sequencing now. Uh, 
and that's one incorporate in its life, and you know which case it incorporates. So, wrapping that up together, what is most important? Of course, first and foremost, long read. Oh, you don't need to assemble anything. You don't have pieces of the puzzle that you need to combine together. You just have the long, accurate read of the molecule. And so be it gene or a telomer to telomer chromosome read or assembled together from a very large fragment. And then with regard to accuracy, we have had bio non synthetic error profile, smart sequencing, you can actually. P50. It is exactly it means 99.9996% accurate. And in the worst case scenario, we just see one error in thousand bases, which is not very much actually, especially compared to other technology. Uh, smart sequencing is unique because it generates single molecule rate and because there is no PCR amplification, it's just direct read of the DNA. It's very easy to go through very difficult to amplify regions, for example, DC rich regions, and um, those repeats where it's very hard to get PCR done. And finally, it, it, it's not all because it's a direct detection. With that type of reading, you can directly detect epigenetic events such as methylation without any vital five conversion or anything going with that. So when you look at that at the performance, I don't dwell on the slides, even though I love them so very, very much. You can see that high five reads have a median for 15,000 reads, uh, 15,000 uh, base pairs reads. And the smallest one will be around 5,000 because we have that process of size selection and the smaller fragments we remove from the equation. That's why we have those big capacity or reads, fragments. And then when you look at the accuracy, it's amazing because uh, nothing for high fire reads, nothing below 220, which is 99% accuracy, is accepted. Everything else is eliminated from the analysis, and you can be sure that you only have very long and accurate reads um, in your uh, data analysis. And not only we can read long and accurately, it's also very important to know that there is very little of false positive. If you compare on the right bottom, those uh, bar graphs comparing pod bio and short read sequences and upward nanopore. You can see that total air towards positive of structural variations and in the um, reduced quite significantly with bad reads. You don't want to discover something you cannot confirm. You don't want to spend time confirming something which does not exist. So that's one of the huge advantages of type bio that is very little of false positivity. Now before going to oops, sorry, <laughs> now before going to the uh, cancer research in particular, I would like to tell you what type bio can and can do, cannot do. Are there any samples for cancer research with formalistic uh, samples? And DNA and RNA is heavily some cases of that. And no, we cannot uh, run uh, FFP derived samples on type bio. That would be good. We cannot use advantages of long range sequencing on that. However, for the fresh frozen samples from um, cells, uh, from um, uh, not FFP samples, there are few. Inputs which are very much important. So you can have standard sequencing, which is in the range of nanograms of the input for your sequencing, and that's for normal bulk analysis of your tissue, um, cell, etc. You also have low DNA input sequencing, which goes to 300 nanograms, and it's specifically important for small animal studies or studies. Of the children, because you cannot just 
get enough DNA from small samples. And also you have cultural uh, input, which is uh, around five nanograms, which is fantastic for uh, high needle biopsy, and this is specifically important for cancer. So when we start thinking about cancer research, so what would be the most important aspect we can support? And of course, that would be spectral variants, long range phasing, methylation, and gene fusion, and RNA transfer high school. And all of that will be covered during this presentation. So now we know how it works, how CAN bio does its detection. And if you look at the historical uh, techniques which were used for spectral variants, uh, copy number variation, in cells, phase, and complication. You can see the evolution of that. And now you can see that at the end of the game, we have high five genome, uh, long read sequencing, which actually delivers your estimated 75%, 67% uh, of spectral variants existed in the system, comparing with. Maybe just 10% starting with microarrays. Um, this data actually comes from uh, genome uh, in the Bible Consortium. And you can see that if you compare expected number of structural variants with uh, those detected with PAC bio high reads, you can see that it's most accurate. And especially if you look at the area. Inversion, for instance, a uh, short read sequence cannot detect any. And translocation, short read, for some reason, those are you way too much, showing that there are quite a few false positive detections in the system when um, accurate high fire reads eliminate false positive, and this is very important. Now let me give you a few examples when a long break sequencing it was very important in the cancer research for structural variance detection. Um, everybody who studies cancer know that SPVR3 cell line is one of the most popular cell lines for studying HER2 breast cancer water. It's been studied time and ago, and it's very well known, it's incredibly well characterized. However, when researchers uh, led by Michael Schott uh, characterized that cell line with high five reads, they detected 20,000 additional structural variants which were not detected with short rate sequencing. Um, and um, it's just further, further reveals that uh, it's incredibly important to have a fresh view of the old systems uh, for further discovery. You wouldn't expect that from that cell line, yet you can see different structural variants there. Another example, actually a very interesting example of pediatric uh, cancer. So there's a newborn which was born with intracranial retinal blastoma and the case puzzled everybody because nobody could explain why that newborn has retinal blastoma. Uh, many things were applied and uh, nothing gave the results unless until the investigators actually interrogated uh, those sample, samples from that baby both with DNA and RNA sequence. <laughs> and they discovered significant structural variants in RB1 lockets with infants. Uh, there was an inversion and uh, there was an insertion. A lot of different things happened at on DNA level. And RNA expression confirmed a novel fusion, which was attributed to developing that cancer in the newborn. And that fusion would be possible to discover in any other way by long read sequencing because uh, you cannot put puzzle pieces together to really characterize fusion with the short read sequencing. And another incredibly exciting paper, which uh, holds from China and published in genome biology, is for single cell, single cancer cell whole genome sequencing. 
uh, first performed in CML, where 91 single CMLs uh, were interrogated uh, for genome sequencing, single cell for genome sequencing. And huge amount of different structural variants were discovered. And in addition to that, uh, copy number variation and classical fusions, which were expected to be found. That's my extra confirmation that it was uh, real. But the most important thing, 125 extra nuclear circular DNAs containing 140, uh, 117 genes were discovered there. And those particular circular DNAs are actually involved in the immune process and cell division. <coughs> This was a huge discovery, and the uh, group actually sequenced 96 colon cancers, uh, colon cancer cells, and discovered um, more interesting things with that. Um, and um, what's the implementation of that? If you think about that, uh, it's important for studying how can cancer metastasize and uh, how we can visualize extracellular uh, circular DNAs for the cell therapy scenarios. Now we're going to methylation, and uh, that's incredibly huge advantage of high five sequencing because we can do methylation studies without altering any anyhow DNA. You use native DNA, and what happens is that when uh, alterated uh, methylated base is being in, uh, interrogated and incorporated, it takes a pause. The polymerase takes a pause and it's quantitative. So not only you know which base is being incorporated, you also know that it was a modified base and interrogated. Uh, we have that in our software, and just now we can see that it's not only accurate reading, but also accurate detection of methylation because it's separated. Um, nucleotide detection separated from methylation detection is just like polymerase take a pause, and you can count that pause because we take a video. So it takes one, two, new base, one, two, new base. And when it's methylation, it goes one, two, three, four, new base. And then when you get complete picture, it's something as beautiful as that. You can overlap structural variant information with methylation information, as you see on the left of the screen, that's the insertion of the genome. This is a different, um, uh, this is structural variant. And on the right, you see how downstream of that, you can see hypermethylated uh, region, which changes to expression significantly. So you can see on that uh, high five sequencing provides pretty much everything you need. It's all great, it's accurate, it's one library, uh, uniform, GC coverage, and methylation. And Going down from that, let me remind you again how important phase in it. It's very important for uh, uh, for seeing which allele has both mutations to the cis or which or, uh, the mutation belongs to different alleles, which is trans, which can guide different treatment options in clinically relevant genes and mutations. Now, this is a very old paper, and it's just a support again how important the phasing is. Uh, just shows uh, FLT3 uh, important gene, uh, therapeutic target in human AML, and you can see how detection remote mutations in that gene is important for guiding treatment options. And you can see if it's polyclonal or monoclonal uh, for drug resistance if you use chemotherapy and drug treatment of a particular uh, patient. 
So also, um, there is another paper which I wanted to show you on smart sequencing for parallel analysis for multiple targets and accurate sleep phasing. And you can see there uh, that a different mutation sites were interrogated in different areas of the genes. And in certain GC areas with luminous sequencing, you don't get any detection because you just no read, no read, no read, no read, because it's a dark, it's a black region, it's GC high region, and uh, standard sequencing can deal with that. However, if you go to CAD uh, bio, you detect multiple mutations. Are they all uh, clinically relevant? We don't know, but accumulating that data is incredibly important. Uh, with regard to personalized medicine and developing that clinically relevant targets, uh, clinically relevant information for further patient treatment. Moreover, you can look at your sequencing data and see where that events came from. And in this case, you can see crossover in the strands of DNA and uh, new sequences developed on that. So also I'll touch a little bit on tumor commonality, and you can see that from this paper, uh, the patients were interrogated with the time course uh, from August 2008 to July 2013, and comparison of the Sanger sequencing on the relevant genes, you could see that in August, uh, Sanger sequencing of 2008, Sanger sequencing detected two relevant mutations and uh, tumor progress of the mutating development clonality, and you could see that it, uh, many more mutations develop later on. When you apply smart sequencing to that, you could detect first mutations at the bottom left, uh, those red were detected by Zanger sequencing, and the white mutations were only detected by smart sequencing, and the clonality increases, and you could see that uh, the mutations develop not on the same clone or uh, same cell, of the tumor but in different cells, which is very relevant because clonality of the tumor increases with that. Now we move to RNA sequencing, and it's very exciting because that's my favorite topic and I love talking about it. I think gene expression is much more exciting than mutations and structural variants because whatever variants they need to express and be relevant. So yeah, that's the illustration how the alternative splicing works. All the exons can be assembled into the line in different ways. And when you do short read sequences, it's just a bunch of fragments. You don't know really how they are assembled together. But when you do ISIS screens, how we call our RNA sequencing, I support seeking, I support sequencing. You can see that without any further things, you just have a full read of the transcript and you know which exon it was at, the, at which position, which is very important as I can show you later with a couple of examples. So how much we can add uh, to BRC able fusion and its mutations. It's been studied over and over and over again. Everybody, everybody knows like high school kids know what BRC able fusion stands for and what it does. However, when you study that with the long read sequencing, you see that there that you can de uh, detect mutations which develop in that fusion four months earlier than the standard standard sequencing if you use high five sequencing, because mutation detection can be accepted as one percent. And you can know exactly to which fusion that mutation belongs because with full length transcript sequencing. And if you look more at that, the same BRCA able mutation, you can see those mutations with the asterisk, the those which were not able to detect the standard sequencing or any other sequencing. And you can see where they are developing in patient, patient to patient. You can see how tumor diverges and additional mutations are developed. And based on that information, you can develop treatment for the patient for the personalized medicine. And uh, it's just the same paper. Another example, you can see how different mutations 
and uh, different isoform actually develop in that fusion. So you see the same BRC able fusion, but time progresses, and from seven months, where four different uh, splice variants were detected, to 13 months, there are three detected and there are different uh, splice variants of that fusion, which is incredibly important to see how cancer is trying to hide and try to protect itself from being eliminated, from being treated by the common immune cell by developing additional mutational load. But that's another fusion discovery example in human relaxing gene. Uh, and uh, you can see on the uh, right corner that fusion actually being uh, regulated differently by androgen receptor because the diffusion there's a big domain of the protein is missing and then that protein is being compartmentalized in a different part of the cell and it acts differently uh, compared with the standard gene so when um, androgens regulate RLM1 uh, and the fusion it's completely opposite so with the regulations uh, standard gene is upregulated, but fusion is downregulated, completely changing uh, the landscape of the gene expression. Uh, we can talk about uh, new isoforms in AML uh, for the targeted, the more uh, isoforms you discover, the more approaches you have for the treatment for that, and um, only with full length transcript, you can really understand where, what uh, transcripts and what isoforms are detected. So in this paper in particular, uh, ICC detected four known and four novel uh, isoforms of, uh, of this particular gene, which is therapeutic target and uh, there is different therapeutic response for different ice forms. Um, we can bring the same example with the gastric cancer. Gastric cancer is in general very hard uh, to characterize. Uh, it's very difficult to have uh, pathology on it. So molecular pathology is incredibly important. And when we see that 60% of transcripts are novel, uh, and uh, there are different alternative promoters are used, then different uh, isoforms are created, you can have the signature. And actually that one example of one gene, when um, one isoform uh, is uh, like no other known promoter, and the survival rate is very similar. You can see that uh, graph from the top, the survival rate is very similar between, um, for, for that particular uh, splice variant. However, when it's alternative promoter and the part of the gene is truncated and the pro different protein is expressed, survival rate is significantly lower than for the wild variant and the standard known uh, I think um, I think is very important for looking at the in insertion of the certain viruses which are known for creating cancer as uh, HBV integration and look at how it changes the uh, transcript. We also can do single cell full length RNA sequencing and uh, it gives incredible results. And now I think lastly, I'll touch a little bit on the new method, which is coming in October, which is called mass sick method. So what happened?
happened with that. Instead of having one transcript for one well and one molecule interrogated, now we can combine up to 15 transcripts in a one long strand of cDNA, which increases throughput 15 times and decreases cost 15 times. So as you can see on that cDNA library, you can see how all those transcripts being assembled into one line. And you can use very many single cell libraries and create one big library of, and uh, put um, some tags to that. So you can discriminate which CDNA library, which single cell library it came from. So throughput increases 15 fold and discovery increases significantly. So if you work this 10X uh, library, that's the way to go. And you can see how you can, uh, this is not actually cancer example, you can see how you can uh, combine uh, short rate sequencing with isoform calling and uh, have a very comprehensive picture of isoforms, fusions, uh, mutations, and the expression if you add to that. Agent. This method uh, has uh, single technology, isoform information, virus, variant information, and the software. So you have everything packaged together, incredibly easy to use. Just take many, many cells and get all the isoform information that is incredibly powerful and incredibly important. What many people find very useful, we do have a smart link tools available, which is software, just plug and play, you get your single cell information and you get data out of that. Um, so for my cytosine too, actually, I just want to add a little bit of that uh, to enable higher level of detection of isoforms. It's incredibly important also to enrich for your full length, uh, full length transcripts and uh, get some maybe targeted enrichment. And we have our colleagues from Quest uh, presenting today right after me. They are ready to tell you all about targeted enrichment and it's an incredibly important tool for that. So it does take 10x CDNA library, you can reach for your full length transcripts of interest and then you sequence that and you get complete picture on the iPhone very, 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 very soon. You also can do CRISPR, and that's how it works. And um, that's another way to do that. But I honestly think that targeted enrichment is a little bit more powerful than that. So, in summary, I hope that I give you oh, uh, many, sorry about that. Right, many examples that, of course, I. So, um, that concludes my presentation, and uh, I, I had some voice over there. I apologize for that. So you could see that accurate high fire reads are uh, incredibly important, long and uh, accurate reads, incredibly important for cancer research, for many aspects of that, for detecting structural variants, for detecting mutations, for understanding phasing uh, which mutations belong to which. Uh, allele, um, it's important to discover new isoforms and to look at the fusions and mutations associated with those isoforms and fusions specifically for developing circuit targets and developing new uh, clinically relevant information. Um, now, any questions? Wonderful. Then I'll give the mic to our wonderful Swiss counterparts. We need to switch presentations also.
So just generally, for those who aren't familiar with target enrichment, uh, it's a very simple, simple process that yields pretty powerful results. You start with a prep library fragments um, for short or long read libraries. We add some universal blockers in COP1, which is stuff that blocks any sort of off target findings or growth you might find, uh, doctor sequences, repetitive elements, like allot elements. Then you hybridize your probes, these are the strict DNA probes that buy assimilated. They find their target in your library. You do a strict out and you cool down, so it'll pull down all of your target interest. You wash away everything you don't have um, targeted in the panel. And then once you pull down your ready sequence um, on your Illumina or Pack Bio sequencer. But the real power comes from your ability to either sequence more deeply or sequence, sequence more samples on your flow cell. So if you look at a typical, you know, WGS experiment, you're just getting reads all over the genome. You're only interested in this little green rectangle here. So why would you sequence all that data when you can just reach in and pull out your target interest? And that's what target enrichment allows you to do. So, for instance, if you want a 20 x WGS library, you're going to sequence 90 gigabits of data compared to an exome, which is seven and a half gigabits, which allows you to, you know, do applications like the yeah, DNA already 10,000, 20,000 x coverage. Which you can't do without being able to only look at the things you're interested in. So, who's been able to handle anything post DNA extraction all the way onto your sequencer of choice? So, we have various methods of fragmentation from enzymatic to mechanical. Um, we have CD adapters or our you know, universal dual indexes. We now have UMIs for doing um, single molecule resolution sequencing. Uh, obviously, our blockers, and then we have various different enrichment techniques to do for our standard hybridization or our fast hybridization, which allow anywhere from 15 hours to about two hours on the hybridization step. Um, we have off the shelf panels. We have an exome. We have an alliance panel for like pan cancer panels. We have methylation panels. Um, but our, our kind of our bread and butter is our custom panels where you'll work with someone like myself, field out data scientists, and wire conversations to find custom content. That you can either run by itself as a standalone panel for your lab, or you can spike it in on top of and simply panel parts. So, like an exome, you have the target on your exome, you give up the target, you can send your spike in panel and you spike that right on top of your exome, and then you have this big expanded custom panel that is, uh, is unique to your lab. So, those are the companies that do target enrichment, but what makes Swiss better besides our ability to print Legos on silicon? Um, so first off, we'll be shipped double stranded DNA probes, which I'll go over the advantage in a second. Uh, but they're exceptionally um, accurate. So our our error rate is about one in two thousand or one in three thousand, which is about uh, two or three times higher than every other um, oligosynthesis technique. And it produces exceptionally uniform captures. And this is the idea that every single target is hit at the same depth. So targeting twenty x, every single target at twenty x, you don't have. 50x on one and 5x on another. So we capture very uniformly. Uh, we NGS QC all of our probe libraries. This is whether it's an off the shelf exome or a custom spike in panel or a custom panel in general. They all go onto a sequencer so we can verify that every probe is the correct frequency and 
fragments. If it's not there, then we will reprint the, the, the probe library. We're uh, very flexible. So I showed you all those different solutions we have for library prep and high precision capture. Uh, we work with pretty much every single sequencer. We work with every single pretty much library prep. So we can get you to any workflow. You don't have to be in the workflow. You can kind of piece together our system and then we'll work with myself to, to make that happen in the lab. We're very good at custom, customization as far as panels go. So again, we work with five conditions. You it takes about a day or two once you get your targets to generate a panel. Um, then you get a bed file, you get to look at it, see uh, how well is it actually targeting your, your targets. Um, and then we will wait till you get to go ahead and print it, which takes about three weeks currently to get your folks in hand. But all of this is to maximize the GDP efficiency. So increase depth or more samples on, on the sequencer to lower its sequence costs. So I mentioned our our probes are double stranded, so some other companies ship single stranded probes or single stranded DNA or single stranded RNA probes. Um, ours are double stranded DNA. And what that does is it gives you the idea of two shot time goal. You're capturing the bottom strand of each target, which not only increases your library size, but it can help um, call rare variants. So, this is the idea of what um, we talk about when we say an efficient uniform capture. Uh, we do this by actually uh, burying the GC content of our probes. We will print them in different concentrations. So from like a competitor's uh, exome here, yeah, just an exome, you get a pretty uneven capture, right? So you're getting a GC bias where any of the probes that are up in the 60, 70 percent GC content, you enrich those a lot more than your than the other uh, probes. Since we can print on a silicon chip, we can vary how many clusters we print for a certain probe, what we do is we buy it so the, the lower the GC content, the more of that probe there is. And so that yields a super uniform capture. So if you're only interested in you know, maximum 100x coverage here, all of your, your, all of your uh, targets will be within that range. So this is what we're trying to avoid, where you have these three targets and you're looking for 30x. So anything over that is semi-wasted because you didn't need that to call your variance. Of interest. Anything under that, you can't call your variance, so that's thrown away. And then anything off target, you want to you want to avoid. Now we stack up, and this is short read data again for <clears throat> for exome. Uh, when we look at various capture metrics, uh, we are by far the most uniform capture that you can get out there. So this is a, a metric called quality base penalty. Really, it's just how much extra sequencing you would need to do to bring under sequence regions up to the average. So how do you make that a more uniform capture? Uh, we're sitting at 1.28 for our new XM 2.0 um, compared to all the other competitors. And we lead on percent on targets, how many of your probes are actually landing where they should, um, how many of your targets have zero reads from the, from the run. And uh, if you're looking for a specific depth of coverage, we still perform better than most other companies. I want to bring up our design process for custom panels because currently, as I move into long read uh, chapter, this is currently the only option we have for designing a panel for long read, which is it's nice because uh, I didn't get exactly what we want. But again, you give us our, your, your target bed file listing all of your targets either in gene form or coordinates or sense you can tell. Pretty much any information you want to target, and we can design a panel for you. We'll build that panel, we'll send it to you. Uh, you run it, you can actually do a test pilot run, send a file directly off the sequencer, and we will do the capture metrics and we'll see how well we capture, how well we pull down, what are we missing, how can we improve either on the wet end, the wet lab side or on the, the pro side. Um, and then we can iterate on that. And so that's a, a, a common thing we see in a lot of uh, diagnostic labs when they're. They're iterating on them to get a really, really good clinical test. Now, moving into our, our office, great partnership with, with PacBio, it's really been uh, a lot of fun working with them. Uh, we've developed a fully optimized protocol for capturing long read, um, long read libraries for, for PacBio. So, this is, works on the SQL 2 or the SQL 2 E, and we are currently always optimizing our ability to design these custom panels for, for the system. So. We have a little bit of, uh, of a, a benefit here in long read as we don't actually space our probes end to end. We actually space them out a lot further. So we get a lot more wiggle room for where we can place the probes. We can optimize the probe landing site. We 
We currently design DNA or RNA so we can target transcripts. We can do exon aware designs where we can take account splice variants and all that to, to pull down all the transcripts that you want. Now, if we look at the offering here, we do again for fragmentation. So we do suggest using Robar's G tubes, mega ruptures, something like that to get, to get your, your fragment size. Um, and then we offer all of the um, library prep, target enrichment, and then you would go into PacBio's smart belt um, system that uh, was shown earlier to load onto a sequencer. There are two third party reagents that we suggest. Um, so, KOD polymerase is a highly obsessive polymerase that can actually amplify the libraries. Yeah. One of the things we found was very difficult for us to do. Um, and then these uh, strict avenue beads are actually a larger diameter that we've had, we found that allows you to pull down these larger fragments without shearing them. As far as workflow, post shearing DNA, that's kind of where Swiss lands. Uh, you do end repair. That ligation, this should look very similar to any sort of short read, true seed style library prep. Um, there's PCR, you do the sacrification for 16 hours overnight. So, pretty much, you get through hybridization here on day one. You do your capture, wash, post capture PCR, smart belt library prep, and we'll put on the sequence of day two. So, it's about a day and a half on the Swiss side. Uh, but some of the things you're, you're looking at, you're getting about the AKB ish range is where you're seeing the, the peak of your library sizes out of. Out of capture, so still pretty large fragments for, for long and sequencing. Um, and our, our capture is eight flex, so you're pulling eight samples into one tube and then we capture on that one, one uh, multiplex tube. So, to kind of show how the performance has gone, as we've been working with PacBio, um, a project that was a partnership between PacBio Twist and the Human Genome Sequencing Center at Baylor College of Medicine. Panel was 22 megabytes large, target 389 genes. Uh, they ran it in a fourplex on the smart cell. They saw 92 fold uh, enrichment, 88% were over 20x, pretty low AP dropout, GC dropout. And this is just a uh, breakdown of the size of the library where the peak was. This is early on when we were still working on driving that, that fragment size up. But in kind of an example of the, the use case for this sort of long read capture is targeting difficult to, to see the genes, right? For that's the, one of the benefits of a long read. So haplotype phasing of the CYP2D6, CYP2D7 locus, um, you can actually do the haplotype phasing and determine you know which which, which allele they, they belong to. And you can get the read span the entire CYP2D6, CYP2D7 locus, whereas you're looking at WGF. For um, whole exome, you're missing large gap in that in that locus, and the phase is important to understand the uh, relationship between the set two d six to two seven g. I was looking at a, a kind of different use case. It's a pharmacogenomics panel at Leiden University in uh, Germany. Uh, a little smaller panel, so two megabases, only twenty three genes. Here's the the gene that they're looking at: CYP genes and HLA genes. But they saw one hundred ninety fold. Enrichment in that 24 flex on smart cell with a 94% um, greater than 20x coverage. And when you actually look at trying to uh, determine star alleles, so they did uh, allele climate for all four, uh, they found 24 of the, the genes were in 100% importance star, star allele wise um, when they get our samples at the low spec uh, tested. And again, kind of the power of this, this approach. You're looking at like DPYD and you're trying to do appetite phasing to determine the star allele. They were able to identify in the NA19239 um, sample that they have the, uh, the star nine and star one allele that they keep in the appetite. So this kind of gem demonstrates the power of being able to pull out just what you want and load, say, 24 samples on a sequencer and still get this level of detail and, and being able to appetite. Your, uh, your samples. So like I mentioned, uh, we're in the back, we'll stick around, answer any questions, we can send you an email with more information from any of our protocols or um, any sort of data that you might be interested in. So, thank you, any questions?